everybody. Thank you for being here in Al Azhar, Dart and Dime. Uh, today we have a special guest from England. Uh, she, oh, you know the kingdom. She is uh, Kelly Cooper. Mm -hmm. And um, well, uh, she now is going to present herself. Thank you, Kelly, for being here. Um, please, uh, yeah. you are welcome to begin. Thank you, Claudia. Thanks for asking me to talk to you about myself. It's not something I'm used to doing. So, yeah, um, not not to be recorded anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I'm Kelly. As you said, I live in the UK um, in the south coast, which is really beautiful on the coastline and by forest. Um, and I'm now 52. I feel really like coming into my older age, early older age, <laughs> my wisdom. That's what I like to see. That's what I like to feel. And sometimes we know that as the crone in the archetypes. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'm trying to welcome my crone when I catch myself. Nice. I deny that part of it, part of growing older because there's so much beauty and wisdom. And um, yeah, so I'm also a mum. I have an 11 year old, so I'm an older mum. I had her when I was older. So um, that has brought its beauty and its challenges because um, with trauma in my background and also raising a child um, okay. with sometimes a very dysregulated nervous system, but we'll talk more about that later and my journey of healing and what that's brought me as a mother. Um, but yeah, she's a beautiful, thriving, and I learn a lot from her. Um, and yeah, I'm married and also married for a long time so that's also been is part of my journey and <laughs> the ups <laughs> and downs of being in a long-term relationship um but he is very supportive and I do feel blessed overall so my life is good um and I feel so much more well since I started somatic work and and the journey with the killer bee inquiries I I also share obviously in parts about my journey with yoga and somatic work um, but that's my basic kind of biography. I've lived in different countries, but I've been settled here for quite some time. So this is my home. Great. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, so what is your actual, actual profession and where do you learn it? Yeah, so I'm a yoga teacher mainly. Um, I've had lots of jobs, but I settled with this again. It's now 20 years again. Um, I, I learned it originally with a group called Integral Yoga. Um, mm -hmm. It was more of a guru-led tradition. The guru was actually in um, America in a place called Yogaville, Swami Satchidananda. And they had a big training school worldwide. So I learned mine in England over 12 months with someone called Rowan Cabelli, who um, was my friend for and still is my friend, but I just don't see him. But we had a group back in 2004 when it was the first training course. Mm -hmm. and another Shiva I should mention as well Stefan um, and that just blew my mind really because I'd started enjoying yoga just because it I ran to it because it was so calming for my nervous system and helped me feel some connection to myself um, after being you know not feeling that way since I don't know how long since my childhood or before um so yes, yeah, so I basically learned with them for a year. That was my first training course. And then I did another training course with the same organization, Intermediate Advanced. And then mm -hmm. I did on a more somatic kind of feminine way of working with yoga and did another tra training course. So I've done one after the other. Wow. Um, when that was more feminine. It was much, it was with two women teachers and it was much more connective than the hard okay. kind of more physical aspect. Although the other aspect was very spiritual as well. They had a lot back to yoga and um, all the different paths, meditation. But the what the woman embodied one was really my first insight into really feeling what I was doing. Um, and then alongside that, I left other jobs I've been doing in various secretarial roles in psychology and psychiatry and healthcare because I was fascinated by humans and I think that's why I went into, even though it was a secretary, I was always learning about the nature of, of people they suffered of with. 
driven for some kind of understanding and truth, um, which I found more so through the yoga, which then also put me into satsang. And I was with my teacher, Satyananda, for 15 years. And I still honor a lot of his wisdom is now feels like it's been more embodied because mm -hmm. he didn't really go. He, it's not his thing to process trauma, but I do think he was a man of clarity and truth. And I felt a lot more connected to who I really am from sitting in satsang with him and retreats. Thank you, Kelly. That was amazing. Yes, yoga is uh, really hard uh, work, no? Inside with our spiritual, intellectual, no? Mostly and hard, yes, like you say. Um, so let's say, uh, why do you do this profession or activity? Why do you, you focus on yoga, yes, and... Well, later we'll see, we will speak about the kilo beat, So, but now you can tell us more about this. Well, anything that brings me into my body, I just find pleasurable generally. Okay. Um, I love the human body. I love feeling that as a an instrument, really, a divine instrument that's mm -hmm. sacred. And I think probably because I've been so horrible about my body when I was younger and before yoga, I had bulimia, um, and all these things are okay. settled for, um, yeah, and over-exercising and, and self-hatred and um, okay. never feeling present in myself or right. So yoga gave me many tools to do that. Um, and I did it in an unembodied way for ages, but it still helped calm me and still helped relax me and help some of those um, addictive compulsions and destructive mm -hmm. behaviors. Um, and it was through yoga and 12 step fellowships a bit to start with that I stopped, you know, using drugs and drinking heavily. Um, I'm finding a sense of myself and how to mm -hmm. deal with some of my psychological issues. But then yoga became just a passion. Um, I just felt a love for it. And I felt a love for when I teach it with others and they're doing the same thing. They're discovering their body, helping mm -hmm. to regulate their breath connect to themselves, calm their nervous system. Um, it just felt important. It just felt like my life course or dharma or whatever you want to call it um, was being fulfilled that way. So I kind of came thirsty for more and more knowledge to help, especially with okay. chronic pain because I was having chronic pain too. And I didn't mention also because I had my daughter later at 41. Um, I then did pregnancy and the mum baby and that I got a lot, of, like, the universe just seemed to, give me that as my main direction for quite some time um and that's beautiful it's just beautiful teaching pregnancy and being with mums and babies and helping them connect to themselves and so important in birth and self-care yes <laughs> wow well, uh, i mean i didn't know that you have this self-hatred well <laughs> and this kind of uh using drugs and things like that i see you like a very healthy person i mean in my <laughs> point of view so I don't know if you want to speak a little bit more about uh, this part of yourself that was dark I never really developed a strong sense of self or self-love or knew who I was so I was always seeking love outside myself and um, the next thing that would make me feel okay so when I started smoking quite not actually that early. I hated smoking for ages. And then I started smoking marijuana, although it didn't really do because I was already a bit paranoid. It made me more paranoid. So the alcohol was my go to at first because it would make me feel so relaxed and I wasn't relaxed and I could come out of myself and be not actually that <laughs> I'm kind of I'm not ashamed because I don't see it with shame. I see it as a girl searching for love and approval. But alcohol mm -hmm. would give me the confidence to talk to people to got to men that I found attractive. And so I oh, okay. sought through sex and drugs and alcohol over time. And then I took rec recreational drugs too, mainly ecstasy. I was a child of the 90s when all the rave scene came out in England. And of mm -hmm. course, that just makes you feel great. It makes you feel like you're at one with everyone. Um, and so it made me feel better. And that's how I sought feeling good for many years on and off and it was quite turbulent because I was getting the highs and the lows and I wasn't a heavy addict like I wasn't using every day but I would go 
at the weekend and binge, maintain my job, feel quite depressed, and then use again various relationships, nothing stable for a long time because I didn't have a strong sense of self-worth and love at that point in my life. Yeah. Okay. So how do you describe the spiritual life? Do you think this part is also a part part of our spiritual life that tissue something and was necessary to arrive where you are now? Or no? Yeah. Just... No, I think reality is what we are and what we've done is all part of our path. And if there is a path as such, but all part of our karma and all part of what makes us change and be re reborn in a way. And I don't mean that in a Christian way. I mean, we're always hopefully evolving and going mm -hmm. back and maybe learning and changing and um, having many incarnations in this lifetime. And um, yeah, I feel it's all part of it. I don't have a, although it was sad and it was difficult and I wouldn't wish that on somebody. I still also honor that it was what brought me to more maturity and more understanding of other human beings suffering. So I always look at alcoholic people or drug addicts now with a lot of compassion and love and understanding. I don't, you know, completely, whenever I walk past someone in the town center that's laying there, my heart feels that knows their pain, really. I mean, I don't know their pain, but I feel a empathy. Oh, okay. I've seen people heal and recover from alcoholism. I've also seen people not be able to. So I think maybe it's the readiness in some way, not meaning in any judgment, but um, the trauma. What but you see miraculous things happen in recovery and fellowships and also spiritual paths and also um, with help and support. I think, you know, there's potential for everyone, but there's not also help and support or the willingness of the person for whatever reason. Yeah, I think that's what I wrote back. I that's love music, so I play a lot of music, different kinds that I feel I need to express something through music or listen to something that helps me channel mm -hmm. that. Um, I love dancing, I love creative movement. Um, sea swimming, connecting to nature is very resourcing and connects me to the divine as well and the silence. Um, okay. so, and healing to me is a mixture of embodiment work, sitting in my truth, integrating what I know, feeling my own sense of divinity, if that's a better word, self, um, and also in connection with other people, it's important for me to bring that into some kind of connection. Yeah. That is beautiful. Yes. Uh, and what are your favorite outdoors and music? Mm -hmm. I think I, because when you asked, when I looked at the authors, I've read so many books, they get muddled. Um, I think I just wrote about the last one I I read, which was to do with somebody with PTSD in Alaska that emigrated with their family. It's a novel, it's fiction, but it's based on how the family coped with his illness and his trauma and how they basically had to leave him in the end but it was all the dynamics that go with that and that living very much in the natural world and breaking off from the rest of society okay. um so I like stories about people really um and spiritual novels I've read quite a lot of the classic ones um and I like to have a you know sometimes different sort of self-help um books as well just to lean into I'm listening to a little bit of existential kink about shadow work as well, which is good. Okay. Yeah. Very well. Thank you, uh, Kelly. <clears throat> How do you begin to be a yoga teacher and kilobay facilitator? Well, mm -hmm. yoga teacher, maybe you, you already told me, but kilobay facilitator, I mean, that we don't, if you can tell us what is this. Yeah, sure. So, um, my husband loves looking at satsang teachers and whereas I sort of stick to one teacher usually or had done, he likes to look at late at night and be influenced and hear different people. And he came across Scott um, on YouTube talking okay. about trauma and bringing trauma into the world of or non-duality and trauma, bringing that those two together. And he kept saying, check this guy out. And I didn't really want to at first, but then I did one day. I was like, well, this is interesting. So I carried on listening and then looked on the website and saw that there was 
opportunities to be involved in the community and I'm a bit like that I see something if I st- I get very focused and I just dove in quite quickly as the third dimension work was being the repression and chronic pain and um, inquiry work was being developed so I looked at different ways of doing sessions and I just thought actually the training works out just as good to do as like paying for a lot of paid sessions so I kind of just went straight into it um, and it felt right and I was feeling the benefit of doing the work and being part of the community so yeah thanks <clears throat> so how could you how could it change your life and others yeah I think it's such a lovely body-based it's not always lovely it can be very hard and challenging but it's a very effective method from for going in and really feeling what's going on the deep emotions and where they stem from and working with our core wounds um so i think it's one of the most powerful things i've come across for connecting aligning mind and body and spirit really, for so how how long time it take you to become facilitator um in total about eight months now yeah okay. i was probably one of the ones because i'm driven <laughs> Yeah, once I see something, I go for it usually. Um, yeah. So, but yeah. not everybody do it like this fast. Oh, no, you don't have to do it that fast. Probably oh, okay. people would recommend it. I don't know. Um, I think there's people in there if, like a year at least and then start. Mm-hmm. Uh, some people and others do it quicker. Yeah. Nice. Uh, so, I, I observed that, I mean, I was one of the, and I am one of your. Uh, how to say clients, <laughs> we call it like this. And I love how Kilovi is working with me and it's amazing. Also, I go to the groups and I participate there sometimes. Uh, I observe, yeah, this like uh, going down, come out, yes. But the most important thing is that we always keep awareness there, yes. We always, the, it's basic that we don't lose our focus in awareness. So can you explain us what is this awareness? I'll try. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah. I think if we haven't got a sense of awareness, then we're very blended already in the story or the emotion. Mm-hmm. Um, the awareness is the presence. To me, it's just presence to be able to come back and hold all of that. Um, and I think... Is any if call it esoteric there's been lots of concepts of what awareness is and the true self and the source and the divine but that is almost saying that's not us mm-hmm. it can be seen as two things my understanding now is it's everything including us and our awareness of everything okay. so it's that which unifies us and that which holds our own everything our form yeah, that is nice because, like, I mean, yeah, when we are working something like PTSD, you know, sometimes I have a session, a, a, a moment with you that I feel like I am shaking, you know, I feel like I don't want to be, I am losing in the past, yes, in this a, a story, you know, or sometimes I am in my house or in a drama, in a discussion. So when we say, okay, look for awareness, is this, yeah, is that in this present is nothing that you you have to to fight with. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Because sometimes we fight with the others or we or we are triggered by others because we have a trauma. Yes, we are like totally our awareness was built in a trauma, we'll say, yes, our no. Uh, thinking yes. of god or awareness we think that god is someone that punish punish us or if we call it awareness god or something like this yes uh yes. so so how do you understand life and the process of awakening yeah i think it's kind of similar to what we've been saying in that to me awakening can be implying some being that's transcended humanness and my understanding that's how I used to see it and I used to 
see gurus as something that which I wasn't and that they had something I didn't have. Um, but my teacher Satyananda always said it is you, you're just projecting on me. And so, and then I felt the direct experience of what awake, okay. awakening is. Um, <laughs> and within that, there's a feeling of just more clarity of the freshness of life and present moment. And um, I think everything that brings us back to who we really are at our core, which is div divine. And I see divine as everything but okay. um it's so difficult to put into words because it becomes something that isn't is something out there I just feel it strongly as a deep presence to what the truth is beyond the stories although they're all included because they're part of our humanness um and I think the more we unfold in our truth the, the more the, the that there is some kind of awakening to our true mm -hmm. nature yeah that is perfect. Thank you. <clears throat> Can you tell me what is a unique uh, etiquette that distinguish you from other facilitators of Kilobi? Why should a person look for you? Well, you told me that you give yoga, yes, and you have all these background, yes. But yeah, what is this specifically, yes, that makes you someone that I have to look for yes mm -hmm. yeah um I guess it's what people tell me because then it's not me necessarily I can also say my own strengths now with more confidence since doing this work <laughs> what people have told me is that I hold a sacred space um that I'm quite gentle but mm -hmm. still focused in the work um that they feel trust and relaxed with me um, and that I have a depth of knowledge that's helpful that I bring in from things like nervous system regulation. Um, and I know how to hold big energy because I've held it in myself mm -hmm. um, and sort of have that sense of self-care and compassion. I think they're all the things. I think there's a lot of facilitators with that, that too. I wouldn't say that's mm -hmm. just unique to me, but I think we resonate with who we resonate and I think we all choose who we need to choose also when we're looking. And I trust mm -hmm. that that's, that's what I, I attract people that will come for maybe a nurturing understanding presence. Uh, so how do you understand the process of healing with Kilobi? Yeah, I feel like it's very, it is a quite direct path to emotional release. Um, and it's always pointing you back to your own weaknesses and vulnerabilities, which become your strength because it is all about being vulnerable, which is very difficult sometimes because mm -hmm. we have so many masks and defense mechanisms. But unless we're really able to go to those vulnerable emotions, they stay locked in the body as do the stories. So I feel that the ways that it's been, it's evolved is, is good, is really good. Um, and also there's lots of, community support meetings, um, opportunities to reach out to people, to talk. Um, so it's a clever method. There's lots in it, you know, from all the different dimensions. And um, yeah, I feel pretty, what's the right word? In line with it, mostly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Uh, so how many years a person need to really heal a deep trauma? And I mean, deep trauma, I mean, like things that they experience like a, in a childhood, like rapes and abandoned from parents and these kind of things, you know, of what else, I don't know. Yeah, I think that it can be very challenging with very deep, complex trauma. Um and never to, but I also do think we're amazingly resilient people and we've all got a deep desire to heal and evolve and clear that stuff with the right support and help. So I don't think anybody could underestimate themselves and maybe mm -hmm. someone from the most dire circumstance. And I mean, the good thing about this is it has a way of meeting that sleepiness and making it conscious. So even though it might not move in that session, mm -hmm. You know, the more and more that's happening, the more easier it is to 
start to recognize every way that the body and mind turn away. It's a, it's an honoring of different people and different circumstances and their, their body's pace, mm -hmm. but also working out where, what can be helpful to bring them back. And I think healing, the word implies we're going to be someone else. But I think there's gradual layers that just get lifted to making us feel more free. Um, okay. Yeah. Why, why we confuse emotions, fear, hate, guilt, vulnerability, joy, and why we repress them? Why do you think that we confuse the emotions? I think when we're young children, if we're not emotionally validated or met, um, then we don't know how to be in the world very well. And we muddle around and take on different masks and and emotional reactions that are all part of life spectrum but things like joy if they haven't been modeled modeled or excitement or real pleasure or and life's looked like it's more suffering and or we've been traumatized and had these things squashed down or then they're not going to develop so that's why they get repressed and muddled up and I did hear that the freeze response is basically just a shut where we've been so shut down. And then the stories come on top of that of I'm not good enough. There's something wrong with me. And then the whole world starts to reflect that because that's what we're seeing and everything. And then on in an energetic way, it starts to manifest because that's what the energy we're holding, not through our fault, but because that's what's happening in, in that way, I believe. Okay, okay. Uh, so this is the main work of a uh, kilo, yes, like uh, through the emotions, yes, through these mm -hmm. certain emotions to, to understand them, to, to focus in them, mm -hmm. to bring them to a, to a life, mm -hmm. to <clears throat> actually to be that emotion in the session mm -hmm. in order that that emotion don't go out when you are interacting with other people, yes, because you now understand emotion and now you understand that it's not real, yes, it's actually not what you are in yeah. who you are since you're a spiritual being. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want to skip back to what you said just to make it clearer in my mind was you said we believe in Killaby, we go to our basic emotions to feel them again. Because that's not what we are when we're, a, did you say a spiritual being? I just, I don't know if I heard you wrong. Yeah, I feel like we are spiritual with emotions. Yeah, but it's important to honor our natural, our natural emotions that before, I think it's the repression of emotion makes them not what they really are and intended for. Like okay. healthy anger is good, joy is good, sadness is good, hurts good, because they're all how we live and survive. And it's when they've not been allowed, so they come out inadvertently or they block. Yeah. And I think spirituality is fully embodying all of that too. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Like you said. I really believe they are. They're in our shadow as well. They're in the archetypes. And um, I, yeah, for me, it's about really, we need to kill and hunt. If we were in the woods trying to provide for our family, we'd need to fight. Um, we'd need to protect and look after. So I think they're all, we'd grieve. I don't think there is. And then calling them negative brings another layer of suffering on top of what they are. Okay. Yeah. But I know what you mean. There's certain traditions that, that have denied a little bit that aspect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. to, to be good and holy, it's, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so how a child can be healed with Gilobi is the same process that like with an adult or you hold a different way, the space for him or for her? Yeah. I haven't done a lot of work with children. I've done yoga with children and also I have a daughter, so um, who's 11, um, 
I think it's age appropriate, really, in the sense that I think children, if they're not too, what's the word, damaged, that's a horrible word, but they have, haven't have disconnected from their body as much. Um, I mean, it can happen quite young now because of technology and screens, but mm. there's still an ability usually to play, to run, to move, to be very body em embodied. Um, so I think children can be easier to work with because there are less mental stories and conditioning. Um, and I think it's about just making the language age appropriate. If I was to do that, I would make it more playful and allow more of a interaction that's like that, not sat on a chair and kind of, well, how do you feel and what, where do you feel that? And how do you describe that? And kind of talk to them in that way, get them in their body, moving, expressing. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Please tell us how do you connect the yoga, art, and healing in your everyday life and why it's more important for everybody to go to you yeah I think yoga and healing and um, art are, are all part of our creativity um, and there's a lot of brain and logical and study and information and yoga and creative and art use the other side of the brain which is just as important um, and I think we need both sides to function well and be a, um, yeah, so important to balance those two. And I think yoga to me has become an art form. It's more about creative expression and somatic inquiry as well. Um, I'm not necessarily an artist, but I, I write poetry and I like music and I like banging a drum and that's my art really. Nice. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I think they're also great for healing just because they literally change the brain waves and yeah, it helps you out of your trauma body into the flow, if we call it like that. Why is it important to do inquiry and why is it good to learn to trust our own experience? I mean, when we do the, the inquiry, how we learn to trust our experience? Yeah, to me, this is so much about trusting, learning to self-trust again, where trust, where we haven't had self-trust in ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the inquiry really gives us that sense over time of who we are through presence, as well as the release of the emotion. And then the other emotions could come in of power and expression and energy Um so that's really important to, to me. That's an ongoing thing as well in a gentle way. Um, and then learning to trust, to enjoy life as well. Like they say, rest, inquire, enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. In, in one moment, I mean, the, your clients and everybody can learn to self-facilitate, no? And that yes. is um, what's like, this is uh, one of the purpose, yes, of uh, Kilo B. To make yeah. the other independent and to make the other like that can really uh, trust them experience. Yes. In one moment, they can be like, wow, I can do it. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that is really amazing because we are creating a new, a new civilization. Yes. I, I would like to say it. Yes. Yeah. I know what you're saying. Yeah. No, it's so important. That's, that's the best, really, seeing somebody just take off and do it and learn to use those tools not be dependent but connect to community as well when they need to mm -hmm. yeah yes of course uh what is your message to women and, and to men what did you expect from them and from you mm. yeah women i really love as i've got older and wiser a feeling more of connection and collaboration and i haven't always been like that I've been fiercely competitive, really comparing mm -hmm. myself, but that was part of my trauma pattern. And I wish to now not um, move through life with that. If I'm aware that's happening, I'll do a process on it because it's a painful place to be. And I do believe we are connected to sist in sisterhood, if you want to put it that way, and support. Um, and so much now is driven or can be looked like it's driven by competition, comparisons and make you feel you're not good enough if you you know you haven't got a certain I don't know all sorts of things body image wealth 
in, you know, there's so many things women have pressures as well to be good mothers and um, many roles now. So I feel it's good to support and empower each other, women. And with men, I feel like there is a lot of ongoing healing work, um, holding and coming together to be more vulnerable. And mm -hmm. um, men are starting to own their vulnerability more, which is beautiful. Um, but also respecting each other and where we've come from, because it's been very difficult, um, I think, ancestrally and culturally, where there's been so much treating of women as second class. And also men have so many pressures too now and always have. Um, and the world is changing, I believe, for the better in that way slowly. Yeah. So how do you know you are honoring honoring the masculine part and you and the feminine, feminine part of you? In a way, they're just words to describe different aspects and we've labeled them masculine or feminine. Okay. So look at the cultural context of what that actually is and how we interpret that as well. Because some traditions say Shiva and Shakti, some say um, the male is the kind of sun and the moon energy. Um, and I like that because you can everyone has both. But there's also things that have been culturally assigned to femininity, like looking pretty or um, being more soft and understanding. And, and the men are the ones that traditionally I guess take it back ancestrally we're stronger we're out hunting food so it's kind of come from that but then it became a bit of a, the control stuff mm -hmm. uh, through civilization and however deep within us I feel we've got all of aspects of everything it's just that we might have more female hormones or male more male hormones <laughs> and as we know now in, in the world we live in there's males that feel more feminine and identify more as a woman and women of the same so for me it's like what's congruent for me because we're all going to be different but if I'm denying something that's seen as masculine like drive and power because that's been squashed down I need to re-own that but that also happens to males too so I don't want to get too like male female because that just contributes to stereotypes exactly but I also think yeah Okay. I also think it's really important for men to be able to own all the feminine in part of life as well. That's they've never, you know, if that's not been allowed for them, if they want to, because not everyone does. Yeah. Yay. Thank you, Kelly. You that was very nice. Or other things um, that you wish to share with our public <clears throat> workshops or whatever you, you already do hold. Yeah. I'm going to say watch this space because that's my next. <laughs> my next leap into faith is making more courses and um starting to make workshops and online offerings perhaps and yeah yeah so oh uh i'm going to to do you have a web page yes or i'm going to publish the web page down here uh, so people can go and look for Jesus, you. It's like amazing. Uh, Is there anything that you wish to add to this interview for our public that we didn't cover in the questions? No, I just want to thank you for your um, friendship and um, offering to interview me. And um, yeah, it's been great. My brain's probably telling me it's enough because I've gone a bit like, oh, <laughs> blank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so oh. I listen I think there was a lot there and I don't think there's anything else so I I feel like sharing apart from I feel a, a, a deep inward passion and desire to share these embodiment practices and to develop myself within this yeah can you describe in five words what define your work five words I've forgotten hmm, what I may have said um, I have to say love. It sounds stereotype, but it's it's I do work in my heart area. I feel a heart resonance, and that's important to align me with whatever I do. Truth, even if it's difficult. Power, but not in a way of being more or better, just of owning my own um sovereignty is the word I hear being used, so I guess it means that sense. Um connection with myself with others um and I'm feeling supports coming in now yeah 
Beautiful. I am appreciate so much that you came. Mm -hmm.